So I'm quite sure that us on the left want to see one candidate stand who everybody will then support. So, so this is the idea of having hustings. It's to give the, the three left candidates who are um, Steve Turner, Howard Beckett and Sharon Graham an opportunity to, to put their case to us and to answer our questions uh, to show us what sort of general secretary they would be. Uh, and then that therefore this group could then, you know, LLA members would, would then no, vote on who to nominate, which would be the recommendation that the LLA would support that particular left candidate. So, so that's the purpose of the hustings. I think. Um, I've explained who the candidates are and what we're doing. I'd just like to say that uh, we are the we are the Labour Left Trade Union group, and we do meet uh, every other week on a Monday at half past five. If us let's Howard in, he's just coming in now. Hello, folks. Hiya, Howard. Welcome. Pleased to see you. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. Hi. I'm, I'm on a hustings without any 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 competitors. <laughs> you are actually. Yeah. Uh, as I've just been, I've just done the introductions and just explained that despite extensive efforts, you were the only one that came back and said you you know you'd be glad to come to the hustings. Yeah. Uh, and that, I, I, People yeah, being asked the best alternate days and nobody did. So nobody did. So I, like, I, obviously, I would. It would be preferable if others were here at the moment, wouldn't it? But, yeah, but of course, yeah. because particular, yeah. particularly, Pamela's, your your questions are hard hitting questions. They're not easy questions at all. Yeah. Right. Okay. So introduce Steve McKenzie now, who is the LLA trade union organizer for unite who's going to talk to us for five minutes where are you um i'll try and be very brief because it's not me that you've come here to uh, listen to uh name's steve mckenzie i'm from the northwest uh dartford and northwest kent uh branch of unite in the uh, southeast uh, region um i think uh this is a very important meeting uh tonight we've had an explanation from pam how the left vote was actually split in uh, unison and the right wing, um, you know, sort of uh, continued to control uh, uh, that union as a result of that. And uh, when we heard that Len McCluskey was going to be uh, standing down, there was going to be a general secretary um, uh, election in Unite, obviously people um, were very uh, concerned. Uh, everyone knew that they were felt for prospective uh, candidates, Gerard, Gerard Coyne, uh, who is uh, uh, an arch right winger, and uh, three uh, 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 candidates claiming uh, to be on the left. And we didn't want to see um, a split vote and the right taking control of our union, which would be a complete and utter unmitigated disaster um, uh, for the left uh, in the wider labour movement as well. So we decided to call um, uh, these hustings and to invite all the candidates. So as when uh, we go to our branches, the nomination period uh, starts in uh, on, on the 6th of uh, May. Um, to be successful and get onto the ballot uh, uh, paper, um, you need, um, uh, I think it's 5% of uh, the amount of uh, branches in uh, Unite. That means 174 um, branch nominations, which is quite a large number of nominations. And we want to know um, who uh, to, to be going to back uh, out of the three left candidates. So, um, you know, very pleased that Howard's uh, made the effort to get here uh, tonight. It's a pity the other two uh, haven't. So, I'll shut up and uh, let, let people get on with listening to the person they've come in to listen to. That's great. Thanks very much, Steve. Right. Um, I probably I forgot to introduce myself. My name's Pam Bromley and along with Carol Taylor, who is the lady that's also doing all the work. We're, we're the joint trade union organisers. So just so you know who we are. Right. Well, over to you then, Howard, if you'd like to give us five minutes on why you would make a good uh, United General Secretary. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, never, <laughs> never the easiest thing to say actually because other people are going to have to make up their own minds as as we all know as to who they think uh, would make the best general secretary but i think you know if i start at the place that you know where i should as to why you put your name forward and you do you, you know certainly i i've reflected on this quite a bit you know my campaign my uh it seems to be the one that the right wing media are most interested in. And certainly it seems to be that lies and smears are directed 
towards me and I presume that's because uh, they understand that if I was General Secretary of Unite that Unite's role, uh, Unite's role in society would remain as a buttress of a left influence and there would be no stepping back from that. I think that the uh, creation of Unite and uh, what Unite achieves in society has been quite extraordinary in a time of the establishment and the right-wing media that Unite stands for so much that is integral to the left and our responsibility is to continue to move society to the left. Obviously, we have a responsibility to organize within our workplaces and to represent our members and to deliver a union that is fit for purpose. But we have a wider society responsibility to, uh, to create a union that, uh, to create a union that, that uh, plays its role in, in making sure uh, that we have an opportunity to discuss socialism within society and the solutions that socialism uh, could bring with it. So I presume that the, that the media and the right wing are, are more interested in, in that. You, as, you, as you develop your, your, own, uh, your own position, you look at other candidates, you make up your choices as to why you think you're in a position to offer your name as general secretary. But you then also see campaigns develop and move in, in directions. And I think there is a reality now that there is a difference between the three left campaigns, and I'll come on to, to the right wing in a second, uh, because I'm sure that people will have questions about it, Pam. But there is a difference between the three candidates of the left now that uh, where people can start seeing and talking and analysing those differences. Steve is very much talking in the fashion of, uh, of being an, as someone who is able to engage as a general secretary with, uh, with others. He's talking about uh, about partnerships and things like that and that language is, is not language that I, I would be adopting. Sharon is talking about a return to the workplace and I, I have concerns about uh, any language that is interpreted as if Unite is rowing back from our responsibilities within society. So I'm positioning myself very much as a candidate who believes in the role of the trade union within society and I think that that's very important for me to reference that you know, I don't want it to be at the, at the front of a campaign that is talking about Unite in the alternative, that Unite should be more industrial with the implication that we should be less political, or Unite should be more interested in our workplaces than within our communities. Unite is, is important enough to play its role throughout society. Uh, the reality, of course, in respect to politics, is that politics is in every part of our daily lives. Politics is in our communities. It's in our workplaces. The reason as to why NHS have been offered 1% and then, a, uh, and then further insulted with 2.1% is because of the society that we live in. It's not because of the lack of in, any industrial organizing within their workplace. It's because of the society that we live in. The reason why uh, employers such as Jim Radcliffe can say to to our workers to swallow inflation is because of the society that we live in. The reason why we are facing fire and rehire at the moment is because of the society that we live in. This making the distinction between industrial and political is precisely that, it is making a distinction. There is no need for it. Everything is political, we know this. We had this argument over a hundred years ago as to whether or not the trade unions have a role in politics. And that argument was had, and it was won for those who say that a, a union has to be political because we know that politics influences our very daily lives and influences our communities and our workplaces. So I want to very much talk in a, in a presentation of, of a general secretary who understands the breadth and the importance of Unite in its role. And I want to say also that our departments are best able to service our members and look after our members whenever they do not operate in silos, whenever we, our organising strategy, our industrial strength is linked to our education department and linked to our political department, whenever our legal knowledge goes through everything that we give to reps as to how they're best armed within the workplace. What we have to do is unite, is to make sure every department is operating together and not operating in silos. And that is whenever we are successful as a trade union. Now, it also goes to say, obviously, that I believe in decentralization. It's in my DNA. Uh, it's part of the reason as to why I constantly promote the change to the electoral system, because I believe that that de decentralization is about ownership and about communities finding the confidence to step forward. The role of a general secretary is not to take 
the position of the General Secretary for the want of power. It is to take the position of the General Secretary to empower others, to be able to give a platform for to find those champions of workplaces and communities, those champions who want to go on our path of being a, an activist, to being a representative, to being an industrial officer, to being a representative in wider society, giving people the confidence to perform that. And that's about saying, that we are most successful as a union whenever we empower our regions and we empower our nations. We are moving in any event towards a federal structure in the United Kingdom, certainly within Labour. Labour needs to grasp the nettle about the reality of federal structures. But we as a union also need to move in that direction. Central office and being a general secretary is about finding those champions of the future and making sure that they have the confidence to step forward. It's also about having the confidence of surrounding yourself with people of talent, people who are not frightened of taking on a general secretary, people who are better at their jobs than I would ever be at their jobs, because my role, once again, is to facilitate a union that it plays its role within society. And that could only ever happen by surrounding yourself with a team of the utmost talent and not being frightened of that team. And then people will have to make up their minds whenever they look at a general secretary, they will have to decide who do you think is best placed to develop an organization to play its role in society? Who do you feel is best placed to stand off and sit off against the CEO when Unite finds itself in the most difficult of an industrial dispute? And who do you feel is best placed as a General Secretary of Unite to voice the wider political issues of the day, to sit across from a Labour leader and demand workers' rights in a manifesto? Who is best placed as a General Secretary to speak whenever we need a General Secretary to speak on behalf of the most vulnerable in society through COVID? Who is best able to speak on behalf of our right of protest whenever we're seeing uh, legislation such as the police, police crime and sentencing legislation who is best able to speak about the infiltration of our movement whenever you see legislation such as the chids legislation and i feel that whenever we look at this and whenever we look at the candidates that obviously i think that i uh, tick the boxes in respect of that and i feel that my candidacy as a consequence has a genuine uh, nature about it but i'll finish uh, pam by saying this because this is vitally important for me our union now needs to modernise. I referenced before that we don't speak just for one aspect of society. We don't just speak for organised labour. We speak for our communities. We speak for youth. We speak for precarious work. But in order to do so, we have to modernise as a union. We've seen the extraordinary example that all of us can have meetings now through COVID, through Zoom, and we never would have envisaged it happening. Right here and now, this union needs to modernise and be brave about its modernisation. And that's the reason why I'm saying very clearly to everyone that Unite needs to develop its own YouTube TV channel. We need now to be able to get our message of trade unionism out to wider society. We need to be able to share our successes. I was at a picket line at Good Lord today, and I could be at a picket line at SECA in Scotland tomorrow. The reality of us having our own television channel is that we give the opportunity for people to see the successes of the trade union movement, to share their experiences, to be able to share their industrial disputes, for us to give the type of analysis that we need to give to the wider communities about uh, socialism in society, for us to be able to educate through our own television channel, for us to be able to give immediate advice through our own television channel, legal advice, welfare benefits advice, to be able to give webinars, to teach people how to have the confidence to stand in front of members and give a message of socialism, to be able to follow PMQs and talk about it in a narrative that young people will embrace to be able to interview the likes of Jeremy Corbyn and others in respect of the importance of socialism in society, to be able to provide channels for young people. I firmly believe that if people understand the power of collectivism and understand the role of trade unions in society, they will join a trade union. And as a consequence of that, we have to embrace modern technology now to make sure that our message gets out to wider society and the more people who join collectivism, the more chance we have of achieving a socialist society. So Pam, I'll leave it there and open it up for questions. Thank you. That's great, Howard. Thank you very much for that. Uh, you know, considering how busy you've been, that's a very lively introduction. And thank you very much for that. Um, I'll therefore throw, throw the meeting open to questions. You will need to use your electronic can because we've now got three three screens of people. There's actually 58 people here now. It's just 
shows how how important this issue issue is to us. Um, I'm also trying to just we're going to try and just post the, the actual we, we we did agree last week the trade union group agreed 11 questions to to put to Howard today. We, I'm going to try and get that posted in the chat and also I'm going to try and post Steve Turner's uh, letter which I, I should have mentioned before and didn't. So who'd like to come in first? Lynn Hayes. If you try and keep your comments to, I don't know, two or three minutes for now, we'll okay. see how we go. Um, <laughs> yeah, you. Lynn Hayes, Secretary of Swansea Community Branch. Um, we've been meeting right from, from on Zoom, um, right from the start of the lockdown, and we've actually greatly increased the numbers of our meetings because they're so spread out. A lot of people are disabled, caring responsibilities and so on. But I did read a comment in uh, one of the Howard Beckett threads that a lot of branches haven't been meeting at all. So, and, um, you know, 174 nominations sounds an awful lot to me. So um, is there anything we can do to ensure that branches do meet and do make nominations? Obviously, we will be. Thanks, Lynn. Do you want to answer these questions as we go along, Howard, or should we take about half a dozen and then you can respond to them together? Yeah, no, I think that would probably be better, to, uh, Pam, if that's okay. okay. All right. Okay, so Peter Bloomer. Do you want to go ahead, Peter? You have to unmute. Hi, um, I'm Pete Bloomer. I'm from Birmingham United Community Branch. Um, I did send an email through, actually. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you fine. We, we, the, okay. Some of the questions are coming late, Peter, so just, just ask yeah. a question. Yeah, so I've got this question, because um, in Unite Community, where we are, um, it's been quite difficult. Um, don't feel that Unite Community is, has been put on an equal status um, to the rest of Unite. Um, <laughs> And obviously, Unite Community is quite different because it's organising people who are not working. But um, we don't, a lot of us are starting to feel that we don't really have very many rights within Unite. Uh, and one thing we do have a right to do is to vote in the General Secretary election. Um, and we're sort of hoping to ask all the candidates um, about, you know, when something's going to happen with Unite Community. Um, in order for it to set up a proper constitution, for it to be considered to have places on the NEC of Unite, um, for it to be considered to have um, places on the regional committee, um, because um, it's been a good experience building Unite community over the last few years, um, but it's sort of got a bit difficult at times. Um, basically, the, the region... Um, are running Unite Community branches, um, we don't get to elect our own officers to put our own position. Um, we can be pressurised and have faced pressure from our regional uh, full-timers. Um, we don't really think that's fair. Anyway, sorry, I, sorry, Peter, can I just interrupt for a minute? We've, we're battling to hear you, struggling to hear you, Peter. Could okay. you speak up a little bit? Um, I can right, hear yeah. the picture all right, actually. Okay, uh, I'll just ask that. I'll just um, I'll just read it's out the just question. Just sum it then. up. Sum it up again. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Yeah. So this is a, like an idea of putting this across to all the candidates. Um, so, question to the candidates for uh, Unite General Secretary: The creation of the Unite Community Section for non-working students and retired people has been successful. There is, however, an inequality of membership in that community members don't elect reps to regional committees or to the National Executive Committee. The usual constitution of a trades union has not been completed in Unite Community. In particular, this means that members don't elect reps to its own regional and national committees. It also leads to a situation where full-timer staff accountable to regions are leading Unite Community rather than democratically elected members of Unite Community. As General Secretary, will you support the target of establishing Unite Community as an equal, constitutional, self-managed and democratic section 
within your first year. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Justin. Okay. Yeah, I hope just... everybody can hear me. I'm having signal problems here. Go on, you carry on. Okay. I'm coming out okay, yeah? Yeah, I can hear you. I don't know if everybody okay. else is all right. Uh, the question I was going to ask is, yeah, this was a question number nine. Oh, what do you think about the witch hunt and victimisation of hundreds, if not thousands, of left-wing Labour Party members and the weaponization of anti-Semitism? Uh, yeah, so that's it. By the way, I agree with you on the Unite needs to be political, though, because we don't want to be drawn into econo the economism that um, Sharon Graham seems to be pushing. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. Pam, can I take those three and then we'll move on if that's okay? Is Pam gone? Pam? <laughs> right, Howard, I'll, I'll spotlight you, okay, Howard? Well, I, I, can, do you mind if you don't? Because I'm so knackered. <laughs> 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 okay, fair enough. I just, it's just seeing myself on the screen. I just go, oh my God, I'm aging by the day, a year, every day. So You, <laughs> you look fine to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Lynn, let's not, on the meetings, you're quite right. And the regional secretaries have all been tasked with making sure that every of the, every one of the branches is active and constituted before the branch nomination process starts. And uh, I've put up a meme and on my, if anybody's following my Facebook or, or website or at all, I put up a meme there for branch, for members as to how to get involved in their own branch, where you go to get information. I am going to put a video out to people uh, just to give people regional numbers as so as they know contact your region, find out when your branch is meeting, be a part of the branch meeting, because we have to democratise the union. You know, it will be part of my manifesto about how you democratise the union. And the first part of democratising the union is making sure that as many members as possible understand how the branch process works, how the, how the branch structure works, and engage themselves in it. I think that's absolutely vitally important, Lynn, and uh, and it's then vitally important going forward, by the way, not just for a general secretary election, vitally important that our members know how to engage in branches. Far too often our branches are, are run by a very small group of people. There's over £30 million pounds in our branch funds at the moment. And, uh, you know, that money should be being used by branches in order to campaign. So we have to do something about making sure that there is much more engagement from members. And I think what we've all experienced through COVID and the remoteness of meetings, but engagement through meetings gives us the opportunity to do so. Uh, Pete, in respect of Unite Community, I, I, you know, I'm desperately trying to hold back my manifesto until until the 8th of May, whenever I've got an official launch in it. Uh, but obviously, uh, you know, I'm very supportive of Unite Community. Uh, you will see offers in the Unite Community uh, in my manifesto about Unite Community, including offers in respect of their constitutional status. There should be no second class membership within Unite. Uh, we do have uh, you know, we do have rules in respect of uh, in respect of proportionality reflective to the numbers uh, whenever it comes to our constitutional committees. But for me, rule six is somewhat outdated now. Uh, precarious workers, community uh, members, self-employed workers, the idea that they don't sit on our constitutional committees, I think, is uh, is something that needs to be addressed. And I'll be addressing it in my manifesto. It won't be the only thing that I'll be addressing around community membership in my manifesto, because I believe that we can offer far more to community members and do far more to improve their relationship with industrial branches, as so as they get community membership branches, get the support that they deserve for their support that they show to our industrial disputes. So uh, that connection uh, is one that I, that I will be promoting big time in respect of the manifesto. And if you join my launch on the 8th of May, Peter, you'll get to hear more details about it, but you've, you've obviously probably heard enough to know where I'm going to in the direction of it. And, and just to say that, do, you know, the, the reason for that, Peter, is you cannot talk about Unite's role in society and the importance of having a union that is a society union as well as a workplace union, and then not look to support community membership. 
The two things would be contradictory. I believe in a union in its role in society, and as a consequence of that, uh, you will see my unequivocal support for Unite Community membership. Justin, the, the weaponization, I, I hope people know the level of support that I have given to members who have been suspended by the Labour Party. I did take it to our Executive Council and ask for their permission in respect of it. I've obviously always given support to the left. I, I was leading the legal team that got Jeremy on to the second ballot paper uh, whenever the efforts were made to keep him off that ballot paper. And obviously, you know, the support that I've given has been uh, has been the subject of much criticism from the right wing and much criticism in respect of the media. I've been very open in respect of this issue that Jeremy was more than entitled to talk about the level of anti-Semitism uh, whenever the, the uh, EHRC report came out. And indeed, it's all of our responsibilities to talk about the level of anti-Semitism. How can you respond to any racism without knowing and understanding the true level of that racism? How can you possibly begin to resource it if you do not have an honest debate about what is the level of that racism? And Jeremy, obviously, as a leader who had been made to own every act of anti-Semitism by any member of the Labour Party or indeed non-member of the Labour Party, was deserving of making his own case in respect of the improvements that he made to internal uh, Labour Party systems, but more importantly than all, and it's the reason why your question is so relevant, is that we all have a responsibility to tell the wider public that the Labour Party is not a party full of 200,000 anti-Semites. We all have that responsibility to get out there and say to them, hang on a second, this is not what the Labour Party is, and the message that you're receiving is not reflective of the true numerical numbers of incidences of anti-Semitism within the Labour Party. And I've been very vocal in respect to saying that. I'll continue to be very vocal in regard to saying it, uh, despite obviously the fears that people have about talking about this subject. Uh, and I've been very honest with David Evans in respect of how I believe he's conducted himself at the moment as General Secretary of the Labour Party. Thanks, Howard. That's great. Uh, I, I, you just lost me briefly there. My signal went. <laughs> so uh, I may have slightly lost the track of the. I can see Mike's got his hand up and Ian's got his hand up. I don't know whose hand up um, went up. Can I just interrupt, uh, Pam? Yes, Carol. It, it's actually Jackie first. Jackie Hyatt. Oh, sorry, it... Jackie. Right, Jack, Jackie. Then who was after Jackie? And then, then it's Jackie, then it's Ian, then it's Mike. Right. Okay, go on, Jackie. Okay, sorry, it's not Jackie, it's Larry. Sorry. Yeah, Larry. sorry, Larry. <laughs> That's right. we're, we're, sharing, we're sharing the venue. Um, That's fine. What I say, both Jackie and I are in uh, Hastings uh, Unite branch, and um, we often share our branch meetings with uh, Southeast Coast uh, mm -hmm. Community Branch. So that's one way of uh, trying to get more people involved in branch activity. But what I would say is that I, I, I thank uh, Mr. Beckett for his contribution and his in, in indicating that uh, the industrial community and the political aspect of UNITE should be enhanced. Um, one of the questions that I put forward at an earlier stage was that uh, the opportunity to develop uh, trade union drop-in centres in places like Hastings and other communities uh, whereby trade unionists can interact uh, on issues such as recruitment, campaigning and community links because uh, we personally believe in Hastings of the community links are absolutely important. Um, if Mr. Uh, Mr Beckett supports that principle of drop-in centres for trade unions, um, is that how would he uh, support it? Um, I also understand that the, the te technology and the way we're moving forward in relation to Zoom meetings, I mean, we would never have had this situation that we find ourselves in now in the past. Uh, but I also believe in the combine, combined with personal interaction at branch level. Um, so that we know and we, we develop personal understanding of people, um, which sometimes Zoom can't give us. Thank you very much. Can we take uh, Ian and then Mike and then give how the opportunity to come back to that? Oh, Ian. Hi, yeah. Um, I'd just like to make, um, to say that I've, um, before all this started uh, last summer with the UL hustings and whatnot, 
Um, it was actually Turner who was the candidate I was by far most aware of um, and uh, have a lot of respect for through the, the People's Assembly and stuff, which she's the chair of, and it's a campaign group I've um, I support. I've done a lot of, of work with on their protests and, and so on. Um, and that Jeremy Corbyn was involved in, in in the fight against austerity before he even became Labour leader. But um, his position on Starmer, openly saying, I don't want to have a turf war with the Labour Party leader, is a very clear political difference with Howard Beckett, from which I don't think um, folk on this call could see him coming off um, well, whether he won by three votes or shouldn't have won at all at the United Left um, hustings. Um, it's, it's almost to me like um, a few years ago when we all thought that Andy Burnham was going to be, if not the, mm. the real left <laughs> candidate, then the most left-wing candidate with a chance of winning, um, taking on Chuka Muna and, and stuff after Miliband resigned. But he was so spooked by the, the right-wing backlash in that election that he became Turnham, Mr. Flip-Flop. Um, and I don't know why uh, Turner, with a very good record, you still see him on platforms now making the general case for, for the campaigns that he's in, but is taking this very bad position on the, the political wing. Um, maybe he's been spooked by, by the backlash of the last uh, year. Um, and Be uh, Graham makes the case that she's the most left candidate. She doesn't seem to be the most engaged with the, the Labour left alliance tonight. But a, a, a comrade put it very well, said it's on an economistic um, basis. So I put something in the chat uh, that I put up um, straight after Len announced his resignation about why I'm leaning towards Howard as the only candidate who's not described as either a relief uh, or even a godsend in the case of Gerard Coyne um, to Keir Starmer. But actually, the Starmer office's worst nightmare would be him winning. Um, and this uh, community member, somebody whose main political act activity is still in the Labour Party. Um, that's at least for me. Um, other comrades might have legitimate other focuses, but for me, that's the most important thing right now. And I think there is a political case for saying that's the most important thing when there's this huge ruling class offensive um, led by Johnson coming from Brexit, accentuated by COVID, but also very much through the Labour Party that isn't fighting back at it, but is instead fighting its own left. My only last point would be, um, if there's the three left candidates get on um, and are the only ones to get on, I think it would be right to have it out between them um, and for us to back the best one. Um, but if coin does slither onto the ballot, I think we really will have to knock heads together because it would actually be worse even than what happened in unison. Unison was a defeat where we failed to move forward when we could have done. Whereas Unite, if it goes to coin, that would actually be a defeat where we went backwards from where we were in the Corbyn years, but also the Miliband years, and even this very bad first year of Starmer, if Unite went to the right as well. Thanks. Thanks, Ian. Uh, so then we have Mike, and then I don't know if Hal wants to respond, and then I'll bring Conchita in. So Mike Kennard, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, um, I, I've worked out that, um, in fact, in, in my working life, I, I had been members of five different component unions which kind of come together to, uh, to form UNITE, um, including the TNG. I mean, I uh, helped organise three, uh, three workplaces in the, uh, in the TNG. Um, my concern is that the the, the official trade union, uh, well, basically the TUC, has um, dropped the ball in related to a number of um, sectors, in particular the um, particularly the delivery centre. I'm thinking that there are there are at least two um, unaffiliated uh, trade unions which have in fact been quite uh, quite effective in organising uh, organising delivery workers. And I'd like to know, um, you know. How does Howard feel about the, the need to reach out to those uh, to those uh, sectors who um, are outside the Trade Union Congress um, and to bring them in to uh, bring them into our uh, in, into our our community as, as a trade union community um, to, because you know there's obviously some combativity there that uh, that some of the official trade unions could well uh, could well learn from. 
Thanks, Mike. How would you want to respond to the last? Yeah, question? Pam, and, and if, if, if it's OK at the end of this as well, I'll, I'll respond to some of the commentary that's in the chat as well. Um, yes, yeah, we'll have time for that. Yeah. Jack, Jackie, D, D, um, or, sorry, Jackie's husband. And I, I, I was sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Larry. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, um, the the um, drop in centres, like I'm all for them. And I'm all, also obviously all for trade councils being used more as well. The um, the the rea whenever I talk about modernising the trade union, and I do passionately believe in it, and it will be a part of my answer to Mike in respect of precarious work. I do passionately believe in it because we should be all things that we can possibly be to everyone. It's not at the expense of drop-in centres. Whenever I was regional secretary in the West Midlands, and I saw Peter put in the chat that we could do with a drop-in centre at Birmingham, whenever I was regional secretary of the West Midlands, I facilitated drop-in centres. I had them as mobile drop-in centres that were going around the regions with solicitors and welfare benefit advisors to allow conveners to bring members to those drop-in centres to get the advice that they needed. And I absolutely 100% believe in them. We would do them hand in glove with those service providers that we have, and we would extend it further because as I, I continually reference, our responsibility now is to be a union for society, not simply a union in the workplace. And there's so much more that we can offer the most vulnerable in society. So I'm, I'm with you in respect of the uh, drop-in centres. And it's not just a narrative. It's something that I, I proactively did whenever I was regional secretary in the West Midlands uh, after the last general secretary election. Uh, Ian, in respect of the UL hostings, obviously, if Steve was here, he would say something different. But I'm going to say what I feel because I am here. Uh, I feel very strongly that I won that UL hostings. We reached agreement in respect of the terms of, of reference to those who were eligible before that hostings. We reached those agreements in Len McCluskey's office and the information that the United Left put out afterwards showed that those agreements had been broken and if those agreements had been adhered to then I won the UL hostings by quite some distance and that's before you get to the reality of the fact that I had a list of people who did not receive ballots for the United Left. Now I, from the United Left, now I offered them the opportunity to have an independent adjudicator of that and I also said an independent adjudication and I will put myself forward for another hostings if that adjudication decides in my favour. Both of those were rejected by the United Left and I felt that I was very much placed in the corner. My supporters felt very much that I'd won the hostings. I am convinced I won the hostings and as a consequence uh, that's why I'm standing because I felt very much as if the intention was to box me into a corner in 72 hours and I obviously responded as most trade unionists would respond which is if you're going to deny transparency then we're not going to accept the validity of what you're saying. And in regard to the commentary in respect of Jared Cohen getting on the, and thank you for the commentary in respect of myself, people will have to make up their mind in respect of it. I have obviously taken a position in respect of Keir Starmer. Um, I believe that, uh, that the Labour Party is in a moment of existential uh, crisis, really, and that we all have a responsibility to be very open and vocal about what we see. And at this moment in time, I see a strategy within Lotto that was all about trying to avoid being in opposition until a general election in order to try and avoid right-wing crit uh, criticism. I see a policy that was all about trying to be a respectable alternative to Boris Johnson if Boris Johnson made mistakes. I see a policy that was all about defining yourself as being not Jeremy Corbyn. And I see a, 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 a dangerous connection to patriotism, one that I also feel, to be uh, honest, is strategically stupid, even, even though it is also scary. I'm not quite sure who consulted with people in Scotland or Wales before we decided to drape ourselves in the Union Jack. Electorally, it is simply stupid in my view. But I will be further critical in respect of the Labour leadership insofar as it would be bad enough to have that policy of not being a vocal opposition for fear of criticism in any normal time. But in a time of COVID, it is a complete and utter dereliction of duty. People have died in an extraordinary amount of numbers. Over 150,000 people have died. 
the unnecessary deaths because nobody has advocated for zero COVID. Nobody has made the case about protecting of life. And in that people want to make an economic case, well, here's a truism that those countries that followed through on zero COVID are the ones that are recovering quickest in respect of their economies. We should have been articulating this from the beginning. We should have been calling people out to be charged with manslaughter for giving decisions that patients in hospitals with COVID could be released to care homes and the consequence of what deaths happened in the care homes. We should have been calling for the resignation of a health secretary as long ago as Cheltenham last year, whenever it was allowed to go on and thousands died as a consequence, not being frightened in respect of offering an opposition, an alternative narrative, not waiting for focus groups to tell us what is popular. We should be talking from the heart of policies of convictions, offering an alternative narrative and offering hope. And that is why I am so critical at this moment in time of the leadership of the Labour of the Labour Party. And if it doesn't find the courage to speak for working people and present an alternative, then Labour and its leadership will become an irrelevance. And that is a fear that all of us should share. In reference to Jared Cohen and the right wing getting on the ballot paper, in my view, there is no chance that the right wing will get on the ballot paper. The rules have changed considerably since the last election. The last election, it was a, it was a barrier of, of 50 to get on. It's now 5%, which is, as we've heard, is 174. Uh, I don't think that the right wing will achieve over 50, so I do not believe that they'll get on. I think there's a strong argument to say that whenever you have three candidates who are running, who say that they are of the left, that that simply does not need that that does not leave enough room for anybody else to get on the ballot because as somebody referenced, 174 is a high bar. It will be difficult enough for the three candidates of the left. But in that there are three candidates of the left, I expect them to exhaust the ballots and simply not leave enough room for a right wing candidate to get on. But and it is about I, you could knock me over with a feather if the right wing get on this ballot paper. That's that's how how little prospect I give, and I do not want to talk up their chances because it simply is not a reality. But the question has been asked, and I'll answer it. If they did, then those who say that the three left candidates would have to get their heads together or have their heads knocked together are quite right. This union could never be risked in the hands of, of the right wing. It would be, a, I've just referenced the dereliction of duty of Keir Starmer, it would be a dereliction of the top officials of Unite if we ever countenanced this union going into onto the right. But I will just say this in regard to why I feel that. I feel it because of the fact that this union plays a role in society. So for all of you who are wondering who to consider as your left candidate, reflect on the fact that you understand how bad it would be if the union ended up in the hands of the right wing. And why do you feel that? I, I, I will be as bold as to suggest you feel it because you understand Unite's role in society. And that is vitally important that we continue to have that role in society uh, going forward. And Mike, in respect of precarious sectors, yes, you're quite right. This is our responsibility now to recognise that the world of work is changing for quite a number of people. How do we uh, organise in these precarious sectors? I'll give you an example. Uh, for Lynn may well know Pasty down in South Wales, a wonderful man, uh, an absolute example of, of pure trade unionism. And Pasty, uh, at the start of COVID, decided, he's our community organiser down there, he decided to, to get a pamphlet up so as every delivery driver in the street would receive a pamphlet telling them about their legal rights, about the working time regulations. And he went up and down his street giving these pamphlets to neighbours. So as every time a driver knocked on the door, Pasty made sure that they got a leaflet telling them of their legal rights. Well, imagine that in the form of an app where those in precarious work know that they're working next to a Unite member. Imagine they tap an app to receive their legal rights straight away. The amount of Zooms I'm on with young women in the hospitality sector who think that they need to resign from their work before they can take a case for sexual discrimination. And the amount of sexual discrimination stories is quite, well, eye-watering and, and worrying. It's our responsibility to modernise, be able to show precarious workers that we can organise them simply, but the, the not having a workplace does not prevent us from doing so and to be relevant to them. And I'll finish, Pam, by giving you this one example, which is British Airways. Baza, which is cabin crew in British Airways, has 100% density. At one stage, 13,000 members. They have no workplace and they might only see each other once every four years whenever they fly with each other. 
but they managed to organize and managed to get everybody to understand the strength of collectivism. And they did that because they had forums where they could chat with people. They did it because they have service requirements of their own reps where they immediately respond to members who, who are in, in trouble themselves. And that's what we need to learn with the precarious workforce. We do not need a workplace to be able to organize. We just need to adapt. Thanks, Howard. That's absolutely brilliant. Um, we've got to finish the meeting for half past seven because the link's required for another meeting. So what's are proposed to do? We've got Conchita and Ross. If we carry on till about ten past, then I can invite Howard back to make any closing statements or to respond to anything in the chat that he's not responded to. And then we'll read um, Steve Turner's statement. I've been trying to post, post it up in the chat, but I'm having problems with the signal. So every time I try and do something, I get knocked off. So I think Carol's going to read that out to us. Is that right, Carol? OK, and I'll explain about the ballot. So Conchita. Don't forget to unmute. I think we can see your mouth moving. We can't hear you. Hello. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I'm a newly elected CLP Tula. And uh, my question is, how does Unite support CLP Tula officers now? And how will the CLP Tula officers role be supported by the new Unite General Secretary in the future? Should regions also be more involved in supporting the TULA? Thank you. Thanks, Conchita. Ross, do you want to go next? Yeah, uh, thanks, Pam. I just want to say thanks to uh, Pam and Carol and particularly Steve McKenzie for uh, organising this. And it's a, it's a real privilege to, uh, to be able to ask, um, to be able to discuss this and, and for how to attend. And I think for me, what's really good about this uh, election is, is that it's really, um, as, as with any uh, general secretary election, it really gets to the heart of what, what are the issues of, uh, of, of building a labour movement and, and, uh, and, and really, you know, trying to achieve something towards, a, or, or if not, a socialist society. And I think really I just sort of almost perhaps for maybe for somebody I'm assuming I don't really know Sharon Graham but but my sense of the campaigns that Howard said is that perhaps if Sharon Graham were here she might bend the stick the other way a bit and, and, and I think um, uh, for me what I'm wondering is, is is the extent to which we have to think about um, how important um, parliamentary politics is in the sense that we had um, such a great leader in Jeremy Corbyn but for me, the real failure of that wasn't whether Jeremy should have done this, that, the other at any certain point in history, whether John McDonnell was uh, coerced by uh, the Labour right or had civil servants in his ear over Brexit. All this stuff, really, uh, if you sort of widen the lens, really, is about um, the, the, the function of the state and how much parliamentary politics can affect things when we're in... Uh, when there isn't a, a movement, we're, we're really on the back foot in society. So I, I welcome all of Howard's ideas uh, about that. But I do wonder uh, the extent to which um, the, the, it's not the uh, the tail wagging the dog that, that uh, you know, the, the, the fire and rehire debates that have been in Parliament, that I know uh, Howard's been behind and United have been brilliant about. I've, I've been involved with some of the uh, campaigning direct action with the uh, go Northwest bus drivers in Manchester and uh, I've achieved you know, I think there's more come of that you know I'm not surprised that that that, that is coming from the, those people in struggle and, and, and the debates being had in Parliament because of what the uh, what, what those strikers are doing rather than the other way around so okay we can walk and chew gum at the same time and we, it can be both and I know we are the Labour Left Alliance, so we are kind of, as an organisation and members, are kind of committed to the idea of continuing to fight in the Labour Party. But we have to concede that um, a certain amount of, you know, even when we had Jamie Corbyn as leader, we, we, we don't have that Labour movement behind us. And I think there does need to be uh, more emphasis, perhaps, and less on um, Keir Starmer, because to an extent this is a bit of a a, a theatre you know and um and some of the politics of people around Jeremy Corbyn weren't quite strong enough anyway I think so I, I, I suppose I'm just bending the stick the other way a little bit about that and I just wonder what 
Howard's thoughts are about the extent to which parliamentary politics in and of itself can change things. Thanks. Thanks, Ross. Right, Justin. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask a question. Um, do you agree with uh, Unite's policy of open selection of MPs um, and would support being brought back to conference? Um, what, what, if anything, do you think should be done to dem democratise the trade union block vote as well at Labour Party conference? What do you think uh, should be done to make trade union delegates to the Labour Party, NEC, and CLPs and regional bo bodies more accountable? I know it's a long one, but um, also because you did mention about democratisation and being political, because at tw in the 2018 conference, there was... Um, more or less what, what to us seems like a stitch up to prevent open selection uh, actually getting, getting through between Lemba Kluski and Jeremy Corbyn. So I, I'd like, uh, I think there needs to be some accountability there. So I'd like you to respond to that. And uh, just one more thing. I think someone mentioned on the chat about, uh, I can't find it now, but someone mentioned about disabled uh, rights, um, some of them being left in uh, care homes and things like that. Anyway, that's it. Thanks, Justin. Anybody uh, else for that, Carol? Could, could I come in there, please? Yeah. <laughs> thanks, Yeah, I'll let you. <laughs> Less, let, thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask about, I, I know that Howard has mentioned David Evans previously, um, but does he, does he feel that the Labour Party conference should endorse uh, should endorse David Evans at the next conference. Thanks, Carol. Anybody else before I ask um, Howard to come back in? It's seven o'clock now, so we've, we've still got a little bit more time. No? No? Going, going, gone. Right, Howard, do you want to respond to that? Um, well, Car Carol's, Carol asked a nice, easy question. Justin, Justin has, has the curveballs. Uh, in, in, in respect of this, so I'll start with Conchita's in respect of CLPs. Conchita, we've already started it, so we uh, now this may well surprise people that we uh, we emailed out to our membership about becoming CLP delegates, and we had almost three thousand who came back in volunteering to be CLP delegates, which just shows you that there is plenty of fight still, um, and you know there is good reason for all of us as to why we're still fighting the good fight within the Labour Party and, uh, and believing that we can affect some change, but it's obviously difficult. But we have started that, uh, Conchita, and we are starting a programme for, for CLP delegates so they understand what role they, they have, and especially in this difficult time whenever people are worried about suspensions and uh, what, their, what their rights are. So that is underway. It doesn't need to wait for the General Secretary election. I have given, because I'm the AGS for politics, I have given instruction for that to be done, and you should hopefully get some... Um, I see Farris has just left, and I wanted to address his commentaries in the chat. The um, the uh, the um, the, Ross, in respect of Westminster politics, well, listen, you you you've raised the question in a very considered and measured way, and you know, well done in respect of that. Is there is a strong argument, in my view, that politics is too fixated with Westminster? A very strong argument, and you know, I'm an advocate for proportional representation. Uh, I believe that that's the reason why the Labour Party has become disconnected from communities because they've not needed to listen to communities because under first past the post, you could, you could expect to put up a, a, a vase with a red rosette on it and be elected so you haven't had to actually listen to communities about those policies. And that's the reason why I think we've ended up with a Labour Party so full of uh, right-wing MPs who are careerists and haven't had to listen to what's going on in communities and it's the reason for me as to why the Labour Party lost Scotland and is now in danger of losing the North and the Midlands uh, as well so there is a, a lot, awful lot wrong with the electoral system that needs to be put right proportional representation I would have obviously abolish the House of Lords I would be looking for votes for 16 year olds and I would very much be advocating in the political context that the abolition of uh, private school education is part of the political narrative. I would very much argue that private education is part of the class divide that exists in the UK. I was certainly coming from Northern Ireland to university in Newcastle. 
I was shocked that the divisions between those who had been through private education and state education were more apparent to me than sectarian divides had been in Northern Ireland. So I very much put all of those changes in the political context. And as we move to federalism, undoubtedly, we should be looking to have power in Hollywood and Cardiff and in our regional assemblies, in our mayors. We should obviously be moving to that sort of that to the, that's the that's the pattern of progress and labor very quickly needs to cut its apron stri uh, uh, strings between Westminster and Hollywood in order to let uh, Scottish labor get on with what it needs to get on to and no doubt in those circumstances Unite would consider its relationship with Scottish labor because of the history of its path and trajectory but so there is a strong argument uh, Ross about Westminster politics but I, I have to say I don't think there's any argument about whether or not the trade union movement should be political. I, don't, I, just, I just feel there is no argument for that at all. The harsh reality for us in respect of trade union rights in the last 40 years is they've been diminished by politicians, despite the fact that we've had a voice in the political arena. If we have no voice in the political arena, I would hate to see where they would go to. Let me just give you some examples right here and now. The police crime and sentencing bill. The only reason as to why Labour is offering any objection to that is because of the position that was taken by the trade unions and the pressure that was put on by the trade unions. That's a piece of legislation that looks to protect the statues of racists with 10 year jail sentences looks to criminalise the Romani and traveller community and looks obviously to limit the rights of protest. We understand that those political corridors of power have influence. It's about how do we garner our influence? How do we make sure that the working class voice is heard there? And it is not heard by exiting those arenas, I'm afraid. That is a false argument. And the phrase tail wagging the dog and all of that it's just simply not the narrative that I want to hear. Politics exists in the workplace, it exists in society, it exists in our communities. We had this argument over 100 years ago about whether or not working class voices needed to be heard in political corridors of power. And it was decided then, as it should be now, that of course they need to be heard. Because without them being heard, we return to the extreme elites of society where only landowners are dictating what laws we have as, as a nation. And, and that is a tremendously dangerous territory for trade unionism. Unfortunately, we know that there is only so much that can be achieved through industrial strength. And the reason why we have a political voice is to try and achieve legislative change as well. And I, I simply, I accept the arguments about Westminster focus, but I'm afraid I reject wholeheartedly the arguments as to whether or not a trade union should be political. A trade union is by very concept a political entity and please please everyone reject that narrative going forward because in my view it is a narrative that could only be for the regression of our movement uh, just an open selection of MPs I wholeheartedly support it as you you, you probably know and um, the what happened in 2018 is misconstrued I'm afraid the position in 2018 was that it was Jeremy and Jeremy's team who put together open democracy. Jeremy asked the unions for support, not the other way around. The unions had no involvement in that open democracy until 24 hours before it was presented. And it was Jeremy who asked for it to be supported. Now, whether or not that was because of the influence of others in respect of not splitting the party, fear that some people had that some MPs might leave the party and with them take 7% of the vote or even 3% of the vote and what impact that would have on, on power. I don't know, but it was the decision of the Labour leadership and Unite had always taken the principal position that we would back Jeremy Corbyn with whatever he wanted as a leader of the Labour Party. And we took that decision at the conference. It was very unfortunate the conference didn't quite grasp it. I tried to speak the conference to explain it, but it was, it was an emotive time. And it was very disappointing for me that we saw the CLPs pitched against the, the unions, which brings me on to the latter bit of your question about the trade unions vote at conference. What needs to happen now for, for me is that we need to start looking at our movement in terms of left and right, not looking at it in terms of trade union blocks, CLP votes. This, I frankly don't go to many of the Chulo meetings before the NEC meets, because I know what position certain unions are going to adopt and I know what position Unite is going to adopt. But I meet with all of your grassroots Labour NEC 
uh, delegates before the NEC to discuss with them what the left position is. We need to move away. People need to understand the trade union movement. The trade union movement needs to understand the CLPs. And we need to be voting as a left bloc. And that is how we will win policy decisions at conference. And I very much hope that the next conference that we have, that people will understand that. And certainly if I'm the General Secretary of Unite, people will understand that I will be meeting with the left CLPs as much as I'll be meeting with the left unions, because it is about the war between left and right now, in respect of where the Labour Party uh, goes to. And Carl, the easiest question of the night in respect of David Evans, though I certainly would not be supporting the endorsement of David Evans as General Secretary. Thanks very much, Howard. Are there any last quick questions? And then I need to ask Howard, has he responded to everything in the chat that he wanted to respond to, or do you need a, uh, a bit I, longer? Carol? Can I just come up with another one? Thank you very much. Um, must remember to spotlight myself. <laughs> stick your hand up. <laughs> <laughs> I like Chris Um Yes, I'm just... Uh, I'm just a little bit concerned at some of the salaries that, that, that these that general secretaries of unions have. I mean, these six figure salaries. Are, how do you feel about that, Howard? Um, should you be successful in, in your quest here? Would you, be, would you be willing to reduce the kind of salaries that, 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 that uh, general secretaries are getting? Well, you know, Thanks, Carol. Carol. It, can, can we bring sorry. just Steve in and then? Of course, yeah, sorry, 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 sorry. Steve sorry. McKenzie, all right. Have you muted yourself, Steve? I think your mouse moving, but we can't hear you. Right. You know, Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Right. Just a quick question for Howard. At the moment, Unite branches only re receive 7.5% uh, uh, remuneration. In other unions uh, like Unison, um, this is closer to 25%. Uh, do you agree with the principle of devolving finance from national and regional to branches and a workplace level so as we have the ability at rank and file level to ensure proper representation for those workers that are spread out over a wide uh, geographical uh, area and are very uh, isolated, but nevertheless uh, face the same sort of disciplinary uh, and grievance uh, day to day bread and butter questions? Um, that other people do in their bigger workplaces. Thanks, Steve. Right, I think those gonna, that's all the time, questions we've tagged was anybody's going to be asked something really quick. Otherwise, I'll bring Howard back in to respond to those. Yeah, is that all right? Okay, Howard. And if you want to yeah. just make any, if you want to conclude anything that's in the chat, I will. I, I'll, I'll do. I'll do Thank commentary you. in respect of the chat as well, if that's okay. And um, yes. and uh, also uh, just do a summary for for people if, if if that's okay as well. But just to answer the two questions, Steve, your question in respect of branch funds, I would support be supportive of more uh, funds going to branches. I would just uh, say one caveat to that, and that is that there is over 30 million pounds. I think it's, it's either 32 or 39 million. I've recently had to take on responsibility for finance because of the sad passing of our finance director. Um, and we are a union that is in rude financial health. We, you know, it is the reason as to why we need that now to be ambitious with things like television channels and ambitious in respect of strike action because we are in an extraordinary strong financial position and we need to use that now to to really make fighting back mean something but i, I would be supportive of more money going to branches but i would be supportive of branches using it uh, having over 30 million pounds moribund in branch finances and whenever i look at it not seeing any activity in respect of it there is a variance between branches within unite there are branches that are extraordinarily active who need finance and are doing a great deal of work but there are some branches where funds are sitting there and they're not being used and I, we need to try and find a way to strike that balance but the premise of your question about should the funds be at the front end to allow reps and, uh, and lay activists to represent to those members in, uh, who are most desperately in need, I support wholeheartedly. Carol, the question of, of payment of the of United officers is always one that comes up. And, you know, I can see the arguments on all sides. I think, you know, there's a commentary in the chat about uh, being a million uh, a, a millionaire, as is reported in the press and stuff. And I think if, if I came out and said, 
uh, you know, I, I'll take the average wage of a worker. It, it would be spun in that direction that, oh, yeah, well, of course he would because of the, the nature of him. And I'm going to address uh, that that commentary in the chat as well, if, if it's OK, please, Pam. So uh, it, it's very difficult for me to come out with that commentary. There's also the strong argument that I wouldn't want to do anything as a general secretary that would then limit uh, the officers' wages and move people down because obviously we are making a statement as a union about what what wage level we believe workers should get. And then there is the additional argument that we do look to get our officers from all of our sectors. And if we were too restrictive in respect of it, you simply wouldn't get officers coming out of certain manufacturing sectors because they would be you, the, the, those sectors would just never get officer level skills because the wages in those sectors would be substantially more than the officer's wage. What a general secretary would do with their own wage, you know, would be down to them. I know what I would be doing with my wage. I know the, the charities that I would be supportive of, which would be Joe Races and the Red Card and the Benevolent Fund, but I'm not going to be making any issue in respect of that coming into the United General Secretary election. But it, it is, you are quite right to say that officers of Unite, senior officers of Unite, are in extraordinary privileged positions. You know, we have a final salary pension scheme. Obviously, those who've been in it the longest will gain the most out of it, but it's an extraordinary beneficial one. And what members deserve in return for that is knowing that their officers will work 24-7 for them, always be there for them, the highest of standards for them, stand with them on the, on the picket lines and be brave for them. And I, I hope... Uh, that people will reflect on that whenever they're coming in uh, to the general secretary election. And just to deal with one other, you know, I, I, I was in private practice before I was came into Unite. I, I can only assure everybody that if, if my motivation in respect of what I was doing in my life was money, then I would never have left private practice. Uh, I was good at what I did uh, and I made the decision. I went from being obviously uh, a, somebody who was active in Northern Ireland uh, my two parents were, were both shop stewards. I was fortunate enough to get to university, but I always understood injustice. My practice dealt with injustice in society. It was responsible for giving pro bono welfare benefits to the people of Wallasey whenever the unemployment centre was shut. It set up a radio station in Liso Estate. It had officers in the Casa in Liverpool, which is the home of the sacked Liverpool dockers, giving pro bono work. And I, I always say to people to please, like, you know, with that obviously came success as I, with the practice, but if I was motivated by money, I would never have come out of private practice. I am motivated by something very different in my life. And I always say to people, as far as my time in private practice is concerned, or the reported wealth of it, uh, to please judge me on this, I would have employed over 500 people during my time in private practice. And never once, including during the 2008 financial crash, did I ever hand a redundancy notice to an individual and not once was I ever subject to any employment tribunal uh, claim or otherwise. So please uh, judge me on those terms and I hope that people know that during my time in Unite from Viscient blacklisting to Doncaster St uh, Stobarts to uh, to Ineos to British Airways to, to blacklisting to Burnham Bins that I've always stood on the side of our members out of principle and uh, that is my driving passion in, in life to try and deal with the injustices of society. I will just reference one other um, right wing smear that is in the press about uh, the miners' compensation. That's a matter of public record. I never took one penny off the miners in respect of compensation. The fine that I received from the Solicitor's Regulatory Authority was about a member of my staff who had stolen money uh, from an estate. Uh, it was an aberration. She was in her 60s. The probate estate had the dogs for the blind and the girls' guides as the beneficiaries. I chose not to report that to the police for fear that she would go to jail and instead allowed her to replace that by way of instalments. And I replaced the money until such time as those instalments came back. The press has been very deliberate in their wording about that, wrapped up in the minor scandal. I only ever dealt with 100 minors cases. It was at the request of Davy Hopper who is the General Secretary of the Durham Miners Association, asked me to do house visits in respect of miners who were not going to be able to get their claim in in time for the threshold. There was no accusation made ever about taking any compensation off a miner because a, a miner because I never did so. It is a matter of public record. Davy Hopper wrote to our executive council uh, to rebut that smear whenever it first came out. And I had the privilege three years ago of speaking on the Durham Miners Gala platform 
uh, at, uh, which was an unbelievable privilege. And I can assure you that uh, there was never any minor who suggested what the right wing media smears are suggesting. So people will reflect in their own time as to why those smears are out there. But I can tell you that those are a matter of public record. And if anybody wants to check it, the Solicitor's Regulatory Authority has a website uh, and uh, the website will uh, will tell you the truth uh, of 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 my narrative tonight. Pam, I, I'll finish. I, 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 you know, I took a decision some time ago not to try and address these smears because you sort of feel, are you giving oxygen to them? And you know, it puts you in a difficult position. But the but the reality is that I, whenever I see them in chat or such like, uh, I have a responsibility to myself to deal with them as so as. Uh, I can at least finish a call knowing that I haven't allowed a smear like that uh, to go uh, unchallenged. And uh, that's the reason for addressing it. And I, I hope people will uh, excuse my indulgence in respect of it. Listen, I, I'll just finish by saying this to people, that these are extraordinary times. And the decision that you have for the United General Secretary is a vitally important one. I'm going to reference it again and again, that our role that we created in society as a, a left buttress to the establishment and to the right wing media is absolutely vital. And it is vital for us to continue to go forward with this. I'm also going to reference what's at stake here. You know, we've seen the COVID laws come in, 77,000 individual prosecutions under the COVID laws. Not one employer has been prosecuted for an unsafe work place despite 134,000 complaints. We are seeing with fire and rehire and free ports, the direction of travel that the Tories want to take us in, which is deregulation, an end to trade union representation and the in-work poverty. We're seeing with the insult to the NHS with 1% and then the derisory 2.1%, what we actually face in society. And right here and now, Unite has to be the strength that we all know it can be. We have to be able to stand up to legislation like CHIS, like the police crime and sentencing legislation. We have to talk on behalf of working class people in society, and we can do it if we are ambitious. You know, I do reference this, and, and, and my apologies if some have heard it before, but in 1946, whenever people returned from the Second World War, they didn't listen to a narrative that said, accept your lot. They didn't do what they had done before. In 1938, it had been impossible to imagine a social Sorry, state. Sorry, Howard, can I just ask you to wind up? We're just running out of time. The NHS Sorry, I don't like stuff that or, you or education, third tier education for their children, but they achieved all of those things and built a million council houses. If we are brave right now, and Unite is the vehicle to do this, then we can affect the same society change. So I just ask everybody to reflect on this General Secretary election. It is vital. Please do reflect on it. And thank you very much for listening to me tonight. Thanks very much, Howard, for coming along. I'm sure we've, I think we've had an absolutely brilliant discussion. There's all sorts of, um, you know, questions been raised and discussed. And I do actually think you were correct to set this record straight about the, the prosecution, because obviously that there's nothing worse than a rumour for people, <laughs> you know, in some sure their own conclusion raised. So sincere thanks for coming along. I uh, really appreciate your presence. So we're going to have to just move on to Carol's going to read Steve's letter out. We, we haven't really time to discuss it, but he's not here. We can't ask him questions anyway. So, Carol, are you ready to do that now? Yes, I, I have. Yeah. Yes, I have that ready here. Uh, dear Pam, thank you for your invitation to attend a hustings of left candidates for General Secretary of Unite. Unfortunately, however, I won't be able to on this occasion. It's important for candidates in our election and myself personally as a very proud socialist to retain the confidence of the wider Labour movement in our commitment to ensuring our party remains firmly on the left. We have a progressive programme to bring about economic, social and political change. And it's my intention to ensure that it stays that way while further learning the lessons of COVID, addressing the rapidly changing world of work and advancing climate emergency. As I'm sure you will understand, I'm currently concentrating my efforts to ensure that this happens on meet that this happens on meeting with Unite members across our sectors and regions. Unite is the leading voice for the left in our movement, and if elected, will remain so under my leadership. The attempts by some to claim otherwise, or that I am in fact a right-wing candidate, are simply slurs and lies and should play no part in our election. In solidarity, Steve. Right, thanks, Carol. I'm not intending to have any discussion on that because we've only got seven minutes left and he's not here. So, 
Um, so basically, just to move on, what happens next is we're now going to ballot all the Unite members in LLA, and you'll get a, you'll get an email about that, and you'll get the opportunity to vote. Um, that will that will be counted, and you would be told of the result. Basically, the, the outcome of that will be sent to the organising group of the Labour Left Alliance, who are the sort of the supreme body. Uh, for ratification, but I can't imagine that um, <laughs> no notice will be taken. So I think we can assume that uh, hopefully whatever whatever conclusion we come to will be carried forward. So I mean, thanks everybody for all your contributions and for coming. That's been fantastic. Rap. There's just a couple of announcements. I'm just going to bring Ross in because he's got something to say about a, a unis and events on May Day. Are you there, Ross? Yeah, no, thanks very much, Pam. I'll just be very quick. Um, uh, on uh, on this Sunday, uh, May Day weekend, uh, Paul Holmes, who was the uh, grassroots candidate for the Unison General Secretary election, uh, unfortunately, the worst kind of thing did happen with Unison, where there was uh, a left split and possibly Paul would have won. What, what's really important, though, what's uh, grounds for optimism is, is that um, we, we really could, that even though we've got a general secretary that we that is on, you, you know, isn't really uh, on the left uh, and has been critical of it, uh, the Len McCluskey and strike action even, that is that we could very well win this at NEC and get um, uh, a full left uh, slate uh, on the NEC holding that general secretary to account. So um, apart from arguments about the extent to which parliamentary parts are important, we, we, we really need uh, a, a, a all unions to be have as much left power as possible, obviously. So if everyone could come along, whether you're in unison or not, please come along to this event. We really need to get um, the message out. There's a very low turnout for the unison general secretary election, but there's enough left members to make the NEC win. So please come on uh, Sunday. Thank you. Thanks, Ross. That's absolutely brilliant. Uh, right, just just uh, just the other thing I wanted to mention, and just remind comrades again that we do have a, a general uh, LLA trade union group meeting every Monday at half five. We have some fantastic discussions and people come along and share their experiences and report on what's going on. And we really have a, a very lively group. We've now organised into three caucuses. We've got one for Unite, one for Unis and one for the NEU. We're always looking for volunteers from other unions to start another one. So, you know, I think we're doing some some good work really in that. So, again, if you want to contact me direct, I have put the email address uh, in the chat box. Uh, otherwise, just look out for the announcements on, on Facebook. So there's nothing much else to say is, you know, obviously we know this is important. Please go out. Please talk to your union branches. Please talk to your colleagues in Unite. Let's try and get the um, response better than the 11% that happened in, in Unism for their elections. You know, it's really important that we we do come out and we seem to to turn out so unless anybody's got any last minute anything interesting to tell us last minute announcements no well just thank you for your attendance and your contributions and uh, i think that concludes the meeting thank you for thank you everybody <laughs>